sometimes remembered as Passion Sunday, and it's a time when we think about all the events that led up to Easter. So today we hear the story of Jesus' trial, or perhaps more accurate to say, mistrial and crucifixion. In our first reading, we hear of his trial. Our reading is Luke 23, verses 1 to 23, and then 39 to 49. Jesus is brought before Pilate. The whole group rose up and took Jesus before Pilate, where they began to accuse him. We caught this man misleading our people, telling them not to pay taxes to the emperor and claiming that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? So you say, answered Jesus. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no reason to condemn this man. But they insisted even more strongly. With his teaching, he's starting a riot among the people all through Judea. He began in Galilee, and now he has come here. When Pilate heard this, he asked, Is this man a Galilean? And when he learned that Jesus was from the region ruled by Herod, he sent him to Herod who was also in Jerusalem at this time. Herod was very pleased when he saw Jesus because he had heard about him and had been wanting to see him for a long time. He was hoping to see Jesus perform some miracle. So Herod asked Jesus many questions, but Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law stepped forward and made strong accusations against Jesus. Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus and treated him with contempt. Then they put a fine robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. On that very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me and said that he was misleading the people. Now, I have examined him here in your presence, and I have found him not guilty of any of the crimes you accuse him of. Nor did Herod find him guilty, for he sent him back to us. There is nothing this man has done to deserve death. So I will have him whipped and let him go. The whole crowd cried out, kill him. Set Barabbas free for us. Barabbas had been put in prison for a riot that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate wanted to set Jesus free. So we appealed to the crowd again, but they shouted back, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them the third time, But what crime has he committed? I cannot find anything he has done to deserve death. I will have him whipped and set him free. But they kept on shouting at the top of their voices that Jesus should be crucified. And finally, their shouting succeeded. Verse 39. One of the criminals hanging there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other one, however, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? You received the same sentence he did. Ours, however, is only right because we're getting what we deserve for what we did. But he has done no wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me, Jesus, when you come 
as king. Jesus said to him, I promise you that today you will be with me in paradise. It was about 12 o'clock when the sun stopped shining and darkness covered the whole country until three o'clock and the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, in your hands I place my spirit. He said this and died. The army officer saw what had happened and he praised God saying, certainly he was a good man. When the people who had gathered there to watch the spectacle saw what had happened, they all went back home, beating their breasts in sorrow. All those who knew Jesus personally, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance to watch. Amen. May God bless to us these readings from his word. And thank you, Margaret, for bringing us God's word through the scripture this morning. And let us pray. God of life and truth, you've taught us that we cannot live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So now we pray that you would feed us with the word of life and by your spirit lead us into truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Some years ago, somebody was telling me about a teacher that they'd had, and I've met other people since who've had the same teacher and they remembered the same thing. And this teacher used to say to the pupils, now every time you go to church, God has a message for you. God has a word for you, always. Not sometimes, not usually, always. But to hear that word, you have to listen for it. It's up to you to listen so that you hear the word that God certainly has for you. I suppose what she was saying was we have to engage our minds and our hearts and sometimes that's easy, we're in the right mood, and sometimes we're distracted by all kinds of things going on in our minds, and that makes it more difficult, takes more effort. But it is worth it. As we make the effort, we grow in faith, and we hear and we heed God's word. And through faith, through faith our hope grows. Hope for ourselves and hope to bring to friends and neighbours out into the world in every way. God always has a word for us. That's a, it's, if you come in listening for that, expecting, well, now there is something for me. It might be the next day, it might be that afternoon, it might be a week later, that it will, a penny will drop and you'll notice. And you'll think, that's what that was about. And sometimes it's right there and then. I was thinking about that because the events of Easter were public. They were there for crowds and crowds of people to see. And yet only some people heard the message of God's salvation through Jesus. Only some people came away filled with hope. Hope for now and hope for eternity. Other people just looked and saw cruelty and, as it seemed to them, failure. So why did everybody see something different? Surely it was because only some of them were listening with that expectation that there is something happening here. What is it? Only a few of them were open and ready to engage their hearts and their minds and their lives. In fact, very few of them were willing to get into the struggle and the confusion of it all and to listen for God's word. Very few were willing to struggle and refuse to let go until they had received the blessing that God had for them. But those who did, they were truly blessed. They received God's gift of salvation from emptiness and despair and just whiling away the time of life here on earth. Salvation to a new kind of life that is purposeful and that is of such value that it does not corrupt and it is eternal, it is forever. 
So let's think about a few of the people and their responses and what we might learn from them for our own lives. First of all, there was Herod. And in verse 8, we read that Herod, when he saw Jesus, he, even though Jesus was arrested and brought him as in, in chains and so on, he, and that there was no evidence against him, what did Herod think? It, we're told Herod was pleased to see Jesus. Pleased. From a, even from a human point of view, isn't it strange? Herod wasn't upset. He wasn't concerned. He wasn't perplexed about how he was going to deal with this case of an obviously innocent man. No, he was pleased. Because he'd been wanting to see Jesus for a long time. So why? Why did he want to see Jesus? Was it so that he could think about his own life and about how God wanted him to live? Was it so that he could seek guidance for the difficulties in life? Was it so that he could know what's true with all the different things clamoring for attention? No, oh, it was none of these things. Herod wanted to see Jesus because he'd heard reports about him. And he was hoping to see a sort of private performance of some miracle. Why did he even want that? Was it to help him believe? Well, if Herod wanted to believe and wanted to see what Jesus really was made of, he could easily have gone to find Jesus because Jesus' ministry was public. No. Herod wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle for entertainment. That was all. A spectacle to amuse him. He asked Jesus lots of questions, but those questions were not so that he could struggle with the things that were in his heart. They were just questions to try to provoke Jesus into doing something spectacular. And when Jesus didn't answer and didn't provide the, Herod, the entertainment that Herod was seeking, Herod started ridiculing him and mocking him and encouraged the soldiers to join in as well. So here was Jesus, God's word made flesh, the whole purpose of God's plan for life made flesh, standing right there with Herod, but Herod didn't hear it because his heart was closed and his mind was closed. He was just looking for entertainment rather than wanting to hear the living word of God. The word that demands our response, our engagement to transform us, to save us from living a life that's just empty entertainment or following on day after day. He wants to, uh, it's a word that demands our engagement to transform us to living a different kind of life, a life that is full of purpose and worth. So what about us? That's Herod, but what about us? What's the message for us? Thing is, it's very easy for us to slip into that kind of way that Herod had to want to be entertained, to want to have good feelings instead of listening with expectation, prepared to be challenged, engaging our hearts and our minds, sometimes struggling, but always keeping on, keeping on and not giving up until we hear the word that God has for us. Until we, every time when we come into his presence in worship together or indeed in our own personal prayer. Again, talking to somebody recently and they were sort of saying, but I'm just hanging on in there because I know it has to mean something. So they were like that, hanging on and refusing to let go until they had the blessing. And then there was Pilate. Pilate could see that Jesus was not a criminal. He could see that he wasn't mad. He was disturbed by Jesus. He knew that he was in the presence of somebody very special. And still, he did not hear that message of salvation. Now, Pilate wasn't looking for entertainment, but he let fear distract him. John reminds us that perfect fear, which is God, a perfect love, I should say, perfect love, drives out fear. And of course, the opposite is also true. Fear drives out love. Don't we see it all around us? When people are fearful, they start becoming, they start attacking others. We see it in ourselves. We become hostile when we're afraid in some way. Like Pilate, we can be afraid of 
looking silly, for example. We can be afraid of what others might think about us. We can be afraid of the consequences if we follow what we know to be right and true and loving, especially if that means going against the popular opinion. Fear is really the fundamental thing that drags us down and pulls us away from God. And that is why all through the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God tells us, fear not, do not be afraid. Because fear holds us back from God and from each other. And fear stops us hearing that word that God has for us and from living fully. Shortly, we'll draw together around the table of our Lord. And so we do well to prepare ourselves to receive the bread of life by asking God to help us notice when fear has a grip of us in any shape or form and to let it go and instead to live in his love. And then there's the crowd. On Palm Sunday, they were hailing Jesus as the Messiah, promising to follow him as the king, waving their branches and shouting, Hosanna, save us, Hosanna. And yet a few short days later, that had all changed. And they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Why did this happen? It's very likely that there were agitators out there amongst the crowd. But a crowd is made up of individuals. Each one of us and each one of every crowd has their own mind, their own heart, and their own responsibility, their own ability to respond. It's a choice. We all have to do our best not to mix up the facts and our opinion about the facts. Be prepared to look again and realize, well, I only have an opinion. Is there another way of looking at this? But the truth is, it's often easier just to go along with the crowd and to join in with popular opinion and forget that we're all going to have to answer for ourselves because God has given us the ability to do that. The old saying says, God has no grandchildren. In other words, we can't just say, oh, well, my parents were your followers. We each of us have to make our own response. We each of us have to decide, are we for Christ or are we against Christ? And it makes all the difference in the world which way we respond. Because we are either building barriers between ourselves and God and all that God would have us know and do and be. We're building barriers between ourselves and our neighbours. Or we're building good relationships. We're learning to know God and be led by God more and more. We're learning to come closer to our neighbours. And then there were the soldiers. For them, this was just another day's work. And to alleviate their boredom and to numb the feelings of horror that they must have had as they guarded dying prisoners, they joined in the mocking. You know that often the tough guy or woman is often behind that someone who's just hiding their feelings. They joined in the mocking and they tossed coins as if they cared about the few dirty clothes that were left full of blood. This is the day that will change human history. And somehow the soldiers right there in the middle of it all miss it. Not long before, a woman with a hemorrhage had touched the fringe of Jesus' gown and in that instant had received healing. But where the woman saw power, these soldiers only see a pile of raggedy clothing. And how often we too can focus on the trivial things and miss the wonderful things that are happening all around us. And then there were the two thieves crucified alongside Jesus. Both of them asked to be saved, but one of them is really only mocking and being cynical. Oh yeah, if you're the Christ, then why don't you save yourself and save us while you're at it? He's not acknowledging any wrong in himself. He's just jeering Jesus. He wants to be free so that he can go back to his old life. He's not open to receive the new life, the different life that Jesus is offering him. 
And so he receives nothing. The second thief is different. He asks, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. When you come again as king, remember me, don't forget me. And he's asking out of trust. He's acknowledging his own guilt and Jesus' innocence. And he's talking about a different kind of life, being transformed, not living his old way, but now living as with Jesus as his king, as part of Jesus' kingdom. And Jesus assures him this very day, not sometime in the way distant future, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. Now the man still suffered on the cross as he died, but it's a completely different thing when you're suffering with hope and with assurance. It's really all that we need. So now as we prepare to gather around the table of our Lord, along with that second thief who acknowledged his faults and yet trusted Jesus and received a different quality of life, let's also pray. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And let us trust your answer. This very day, you will be with me in my kingdom. So trusting your promise, Lord, we now gather around your table to be nourished in faith by you so that we can go out to live this day and every day as your people and as citizens of your eternal kingdom. Amen. And so we sing together, ride on, ride on in majesty. and the tokens will be received. This is the table of the Lord. It's not the table of any one denomination. Therefore, to it we affectionately invite members of any branch of the universal church who love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. And let us stand to affirm our faith and the church's faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. Third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Come to the table, not because you are strong, but because you know you have plenty of weaknesses. Come not because you think you're so good that you deserve to come or have the right to come, but come because you know you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord even a little and want to grow to love him more. But most of all, come because he first loved you and gave himself for you. Hear and trust the words of Christ. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. And let us pray. Almighty God, unto you all hearts are open and all desires known. From you no secrets are hidden. So now we pray that you would cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by breathing into us your Holy Spirit, that we may fully love you and truly praise your holy name. Amen. And let us hear once again St. Paul's account of how this sacrament began. Paul wrote, I received of the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the very night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. So following the Lord's example, we take this bread and this wine to be set aside from everyday use for this holy use and this mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed, let us present to God our prayers and our thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It's both our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give thanks and to praise you, Lord. You are our Holy Father, our Heavenly King, our almighty and eternal God. And we come to you through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. So now we join with angels and archangels and your whole church on earth and in heaven, worshipping and adoring you in those ancient words, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O God Most High. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <coughs> Lord of creation, we praise you for this amazing and complex world with all its variations and life with all its blessings and those who use the gifts you give them to bring your blessing to others. Thank you for everyone who loves us and is patient with us. We bless you for the family of the church, where we are nourished in faith and strengthened in trouble and enabled to serve the kingdom of your, your kingdom in this world in ways we couldn't do on our own. Today we particularly pray for sisters and brothers who are persecuted because they want to live by your truth and in your love of all. Above all else, thank you for coming to us in Jesus Christ. In him we know forgiveness and the healing of our hearts. With Jesus we find joy and peace. So now remembering our Saviour's birth and life and his death upon the cross, 
celebrating his resurrection and ascension into heaven and looking forward to the day he comes again in glory to complete the redemption of creation, we, your servants, now set forth this memorial. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to sanctify us and to sanctify this, your own gift of bread and wine, so that the bread we break and the wine we share may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And as we receive them by faith, we may be partakers of his body and blood with all his blessings for our spiritual nourishment and our growth in grace. Receive us, Father, as we offer you our praise and worship and everything about ourselves. And we ask that you would fulfill your will in us and all people so that everything in heaven and earth may be brought together under Christ as head, by whom, with whom, in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. And hear us as we pray aloud as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. According to the holy institution and the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of him, we do this, who on the very night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you and for many. It is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Give us your peace. Amen. So now take and eat. This is the body of Christ which was broken for you. Do this, mindful of him. Let everyone drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of him. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these tangible gifts of things that are beyond our full understanding, the touch and the taste of things which are invisible and yet which are the sign and the seal of your pardon and your peace. Thank you for our communion with you and each other and your whole church on earth and in heaven, especially remembering those so dear to us who for a little while we see no more. Thank you that there's nothing that can separate us from your love in Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and dominion throughout all ages. Amen. And so we sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
And now with Jesus as your king, go back out into the world to serve him as you serve your neighbours. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever and ever. Amen.